It was that silent night when the stars turned their gaze to marvel at the earth. When the heavens gathered breathless round a lowly stable. When a young mother wept tears of worship, falling on the baby in her arms. And the song of the earth arose in Bethlehem, soft as the tender beating of his heart. And all was calm, all was bright. Yet could this be the same God of Abraham, the conqueror of Israel, this baby? This fragile life. Is this child the one who burned his name in rapture across the gasping skies? Whose voice spoke the oceans into crashing rhythms? Who crafted the mountains into guardians of the firmament? Whose hand ignited the thirst of the deserts and the warring surge of the elemental hosts? Who breathed life from dust? Broke the oppressor's rule? scattered the chains of his people like sand and led them through the wilderness with a pillar of flame. Is this child the one whose presence billowed thunderous on Sinai's peak? Who surrounded Job with the roaring wind, stood defiant in the raging furnace, wrote judgment against tyrants and blazed on the lips of the prophets, scorching history's pages with the fury of his might? this be the same God who chose to come as the vulnerable king, setting his throne on straw and manger, drawing forth the tears of shepherds, receiving the gifts of wandering travelers, his fame unknown in this world. He is Jesus, the one who thunders through the heavens yet whispers to our hearts, who reigns victorious, yet bows to serve the broken. He is God in the fury, God in the silence. He holds this mystery balanced in his hands, holds our questions till they lose their need, until all we see is him. I got the Wikipedia uh, definition of Advent. Advent is a season observed in many Christian churches as a time of expectant waiting and preparation for the celebration of the nativity of Jesus at Christmas, as well as the return of Jesus at the second coming. I don't think this is something that we necessarily know. I know as I was growing up in a, in a church, uh, they never talked about the second coming as a part of the Advent celebration. The term is a version of the Latin word meaning coming. He came incarnate in the, in the, the person of Jesus. He's coming again And I want to talk about that, this first and second coming. As we begin Advent, uh, I'm going to focus this morning on his return. In Foursquare, we believe that Jesus is the healer, Jesus is the baptizer of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is the Savior, and that Jesus is the soon-coming King. Those are the four squares of Foursquare. He is going to come again. And my own story is wrapped around the second coming because I was one of those individuals that was not hostile towards God. I actually had a significant amount of curiosity when it came to God, but I also had this sense that maybe I had some wild oats to sow, that I had some things I wanted to do before I really started to investigate this person of Jesus Christ. Now, like many people, very possibly, part of that sowing of the wild oats led me into places of incredible bondage and brokenness and destruction. And it was the story of Jesus' return that really perked my attention and caused me literally to yield my life completely and totally to him. And I felt, much like the people in the cardboard testimony, the power of God begin to set me free. And I have freedom and I have friendships that I can only explain as a result of this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But it was, again, for me this idea that he's going to return, and I'd better figure out what that means and what I have to do to be right with him. Because if he returns and I'm not ready, I'm not very excited 
about that possibility. And I want you to hear from our Bibles what it says about his return and what it's going to look like from Revelation chapter 19. And just understand something about what they call apocryphal language. It really isn't written in a way that you're going to understand. But it is definitely declaring that he's going to return. So this is what Jesus is going to look like in his return. Then I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and his head, on his head are many diadems. And his name And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. That comes from uh, the Gospel of John. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty on his robe and on his thigh. He has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So here we see in the person of Jesus Christ in his second coming, tattoos. Yeah. Yeah. So lighten up a little bit. (laughs) But I remember the first time that I held my beautiful oldest daughter, Annie. And as I held that little girl, I felt like, you know what, if anyone ever threatened this little girl, they would have to go through me, and it would be the most uh, ferocious uh, fight that they'd ever entered into because there was nothing that was going to happen to that little girl. And what I want you to understand is that as Jesus stepped into and onto the earth in the person uh, of Jesus Christ, that was his first coming. In his second coming, he's coming with the wrath of God. He's coming as the one that is going to put an end to the darkness and the destruction and the brokenness. And what's interesting about that is the Bible actually describes that uh, his presence will be so terrifying that people will run to the mountains. But it also declares that the mountains will literally flee from his presence. So that is a picture of what God is going to look like in the person of Jesus Christ in his second coming. And again, we don't talk about that very often. And as we celebrate Christmas, I think it's important as we celebrate Advent to recognize this is a part of the unfolding salvation history story. And the invitation is always constant all the way through. And that is a very simple uh, invitation. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you you rest. So at this second advent, the one that is yet to come at the return of Jesus, the plea of God to the world to repent and believe and to find forgiveness and wholeness and life is over. That's the end of that season. So in light of that, that he promises to return in that season, which again we're in right now, uh, will be over, how are we to think How are we to live? I found this quote, the majesty of God is somewhat veiled in the first advent. Because God takes on flesh and dwells among us, there will be no veiling at the second coming. There will be no veiling. He will literally, I love this explanation, he will literally tear open the reality that you and I know and step into it. He will invade the universe in such a way that the full magnitude of the glory of God will be made visible. That is the day that is coming. So again, how are we supposed to live knowing that that is on our horizon? Whether we're following Jesus or not, this is the declaration of our Bibles of Christianity. This is the declaration. And as Peter was writing to a group of followers, In his second letter to them, he describes how I think we are supposed to live, and he gives us five things that are important, I think, for us to think about as we ask ourselves that question, how am I to live knowing that he's returning? 
So here's what Peter said in his letter. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come up in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? Forever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of the water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed, existed was deluged with water and perished." But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord's not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for the, and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Man, that's a lot of stuff. And here's what I want to say to you as I give you five things that I think are important. The first of them is this, we must work to remember. You know, I'm, I'm concerned about this even as I say it, because one of the things that I'm beginning to realize, one of the things that is trending, one of the things that we're studying as we lead local churches is that church attendance is in decline. More and more people are declaring that they have no affiliation to church at all. Which to me says no, more and more people believe that church has no relevance in their lives. And as I hear things like this, I wonder if that's what's happening in our culture, how many of us who still do manage to wander into church every once in a while really have the kind of devotional life that causes us to know what God's all about? How many of us spend any time at all in our everyday lives really looking into what is going on in God's plan for us. We're being told by Peter to remember. Well, it's hard to remember what we don't know. Again, I grew up in, a, in another church, in another denomination, and, and we never, I didn't know anything about the second coming. When I started to hear about that, I started to investigate it because I was curious, and that investigation led me to the place where I said yes to Jesus. I don't know if you know this about Rooted, but Rooted was developed in Africa because God is going crazy doing amazing things in Africa. So many people are coming to Jesus in Africa that a church there sat down and said, we've got to disciple this pe these people. What are we going to do? So they developed Rooted. And Rooted was brought to America. We are the direct benefits of what is happening in Africa. What's sad to me is it's not happening in America. It's not happening in America. How can you remember what you don't know? How can you remember that he's been faithful? How can you remember that a Messiah was promised and a Messiah was given? How can you remember that there was going to be an atoning death and there was an atoning death? Do you even know what atoning means? Remember there was a resurrection promised and a resurrection given. Remember that the gospel was going to go into the whole world and we're watching the gospel spread throughout the whole world, breaking out in Asia and South America and Central America and again in Africa, the 1040 window where most of the Muslim nations are. People are coming to Jesus by the millions in that place 
right now. God is doing incredible things. All of that was supposed to happen before Jesus' return. We were promised a return. Again, I think we need to work hard. I would challenge you with the idea. If you don't have a devotional life, a personal devotional life, uh, we have a deal on our, on our webpage, an app where if you get on it every day and it's about 10 minutes of reading, you will go through the Bible once every year, the New Testament twice in a year. And I've been doing that for 20 years. That is a simple step in obedience so that you know what you know. So that's the first thing, to work to remember. I think it's important, secondly, to remember he is returning. That's the promise. It's a promise of God. And again, remember how faithful he has been in the promises that have already been fulfilled. Those promises also declared that there would be an imminent return. And because of that, what's interesting, and I love this from this piece of scripture, of scripture, that scoffers would rise. People will rise up and say, oh, that Christianity, that Bible, that, that Bible, you don't need to read that thing. That's just an ancient text. It's an ancient book. Nothing in there matters anymore. They will literally mock. They will mock. And here's what's interesting. They will mock the Bible. They will look for errors in the Bible, but they won't, um, they won't look at their own life that way. They won't look at the, own, the things that they believe. They won't th look at the al alternatives to what the Bible says and, and, and really do any kind of critical thinking. So they consider themselves intellectuals, and yet they will not in an intellectual way look at the Bible. And here's what's happened to the people who intellectually looked at the Bible trying to find error. Many of them have written books about how this is right and real and true. They find Jesus when they start to read the Bible. And again, I don't want to find, uh, offend you if you feel like you're intellectual. I've several times in the last several months said that several things would categorize you and what is stupid for me. And, and I just want you to know that uh, I realize because I have small grandkids, you should not say stupid. <laughs> and I'm sorry that I said stupid from up here. I will try not to do that ever again. But I get frustrated when people stand against God and they don't know what they're talking about because they've spent no time trying to discover who he is and what he's all about. 500 years ago, the Reformation started. Luther, who started that Reformation, reading the book of Romans, said that he had to lay hold of Paul and beat him till he submitted. So in other words, he dove in and read and wrestled and fought with his Bible until it made sense to him. I would ask you how many of you approach the word of God like that? And here, here's my confession. I oftentimes feel like, hey, it's been a long time. You're supposed to return. It's been a long time. And the Bible itself makes this declaration. It'll be like in the days of Noah when the, uh, with the come, second coming of the Son of Man. In those days, the, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and they were unaware that a flood was gonna sweep through and destroy them all. And as I think about this and, and, and recognize and realize there are really two dates in my life that I remember where it was just like that. I was just, we were just, one of them when I was very small, but when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, I remember that the earth almost stood still that day. And I was just a little, little boy. But that just rocked our world. And the second is 9-11, when those planes drove into the Twin Towers, into the Pentagon, and into that field. I mean, I don't know where you are, but I can still in my mind's eye very clearly see we actually opened up our church because we were in a few places that had these screens that could connect to television, and our church filled with people who just sat there and watched those towers burn and then watched those towers fall. I mean, we were sitting in a church when those towers actually collapsed. I remember those days. And we're going to be having days like that when Jesus returns. So what we also see in the text that I just read to you is the nature and the plan of God, and this is so important. Because we think God is limited as we are limited, and that is just not true. We're finite. He's infinite. We are inside time. He is not inside time. 
That's not true about God. God is outside time. So the present, the future, those aren't things that he knows about. They are places that he is. It's places that he's at. So he's not confined. This is not slow to him. And the second piece of this is that what we see in God holding back is he's restraining that wrath that it will be poured out because he is patient and he longs for us to come to repentance. And again, I'm so grateful that I made the decision to follow Jesus before he, he returns. And again, I would say to you, he's not being slow because his plan is to rescue and to ransom men and women of every tribe and tongue and nation on earth. Uh, his wrath is being held black, back while his glory spreads, and it is spreading at an incredible rate right now. So that unbelievable invitation is still on the table for all of us and for everyone we know and love. And that is that we can confess our sins and he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and move us into this place where we're a part of his family where we'll have friends that will love us incredibly well and we'll have freedom to live our lives and be fruitful. So that's the third one. The fourth is the day is coming when all things will be made new. And again, as we see this fire in his eyes and the sword and all of those stuff, that can, can mess with our minds. And it really kind of can almost make us feel like, what the heck? You know, why would he do that? But as anything that is refined, you have to burn away the impurities so that everything that is left is pure. And man, as that day comes... The world that is going to be left is going to be so amazing without this brokenness, without this pain, without the crying, without the weeping, without all that we experience. I mean, I look forward to that day. One of the things that I get to do with my life is, is usher people into eternity, which very simply means I do funerals. And I watch people hurt and in pain because they've lost people that they love. And we're entering a time upon Jesus' return where that will not be true. I go visit people in hospitals. And again, I won't have to do that anymore because there will be no more pain and there will be no more sickness. Those are going to be good days, aren't they, Jason? Yeah. Those are going to be good days. So here's the fifth thing, the last thing. In light of all these things, what sort of people should we be? As we enter into Advent, as we celebrate Christmas, as we celebrate not just his first coming, but his second coming, what kind of people should we be? And it just simply says that we need to be alert and that we need to stay awake, that we can't be people who have forgotten we have to be serious about holiness and, and serious about learning and leaning into his grace. We got to think about our day in and day out life being something that brings glory and honor to him. We have to change the way that we live. So for us around here, the definition for what that looks like is that you love God and you love people and you serve the world. That's what it looks like. It's not just the definition, but it's the pathway. That's how you do life. You love God. You love people. It's always led with love. Everything that we do beyond that, all of the serving, all of the giving, all of the shoeboxes, all, all of the serving, all of the, the gifts to the world, all of those things are a byproduct of the love that manifests itself because we are followers of Jesus Christ. We are followers of Jesus Christ. Let me end with this. Our youth pastor, Vinny, got married this summer, married Heather. Yeah. And I love this because more and more weddings are being done outside and this was done at this really, really cool ranch, a very cool setting and you know, Vinny was handsome as all get out, and Heather was just as beautiful as she could be, and, and they had all of their attendants, and all of us dressed a little bit nicer, and, uh, and went and, and were a part of not just the ceremony, but then we had this amazing party in this massive old barn afterwards, great fruit, food, great drink. Uh, there was dancing. I left before the dancing because I just didn't want to embarrass people. <laughs> 
That 70s stuff just doesn't fly anymore. (laughs) You know that stuff? (laughs) Little air guitar. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But the return of Jesus is most often described like that. I love that picture. I love that picture. I just got goosebumps saying it out loud. I just love that picture. That's what we're looking forward to. That, as we're celebrating Advent, is what we are celebrating. Let me pray. Lord, I give you praise today. I thank you for the beginning of Advent in this church. I pray that everything that each and every one of us does is something that really stands for who you are and what you're doing in the earth, what you've done on the earth, what you intend to do in the earth. Lord, let us be people. Let us be people that appropriately and well celebrate Advent. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that that's your will, that's your desire. And again, I pray that we would yield to your leading as we do that. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I always give this opportunity. You might be someone in this room who has yet to say yes to Jesus. Um, That's not good news for you when he returns. But more than that, you're missing all of the incredible life that he has planned for you right now. So if that's you and you want to say yes to Jesus, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. All I'm going to ask you to do is raise your hand and say, that's me. I want to say yes to Jesus. I've never done that. I need to do that. I want to do that. I'm going to do that. Here's my lifted hand. Anyone at all? Well, Father, my prayer for us, my prayer for us is as we leave this place today, that we will truly in very real ways be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world that we live in. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, well thank you for coming today, yeah.